Greetings, fellow ghouls, and thanks for stopping by on this stormy evening. It's good to have you back here at Aberfoyle Manor. It feels like it's been a while. You've picked the perfect time to return. It just so happens to be my favorite time of year. That slight chill in the air. Yes, autumn is on its way, with Halloween following closely behind. How about we celebrate the start of the spooky season with a true scary story from my collection? Come, yes, warm yourself by the fire, and I'll tell you the tale of the Ouija board. The summer after my freshman year of college, a few of the new friends I'd made that year decided to go in on a weekend-long rental at a lake house in upstate New York. There were five of us all together, and after dividing the price evenly between us, we could afford a weekend at a big old cabin right next to the water. Our finals period that May had been incredibly rigorous, and I'd taken most of my exams on just an hour or two of sleep. One of them I'd taken without any sleep at all. By the end of the year, I was practically living in one of the study rooms I'd like to use, a closet-sized space in the library. I was definitely looking forward to finally relaxing getting some sun by the water and sleeping in a hammock while listening to the sounds of nature and bathing in the sunlight. My roommate Jay, on the other hand, was more of a blow-off-some-steam kind of guy. He had found the rental, insisting on the big old cabin because there'd be more room to party. He made sure we grabbed a few cases of beer to bring for the weekend. The five of us were me, Jay, his girlfriend Katie, another girl Addison, and our other friend Curtis. Jay lived on Long Island, so he met the rest of us in Manhattan one June morning with his car, and we started the drive up. I stuffed my bag in the trunk of Jay's mid-size SUV, where there wasn't much room left. Like I said, Jay had been sure to bring a few cases of beer which were occupying a fair bit of real estate in the back of the vehicle. I hadn't been much of a drinker in high school, and even through my first year of college I'd barely touched a drop, but I was feeling pretty comfortable with my new friends and thought, hey, if the mood was right and everything felt safe, maybe I would finally cut loose. It was a pretty long drive to the cabin. I had been to upstate New York once or twice, but this place was so far north that it was closer to Canada and right next to Vermont. The further we drove, the more excited the five of us got. Being packed into that car together reminded us of being packed into those classrooms, dorm rooms, study rooms. All these places with room in the name never seemed to have much room to go around. As we were driving, Katie was the first to notice some dark-looking clouds on the horizon. No, 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 Jay protested. The weather's supposed to be nice this whole weekend. Addison tried to keep everyone's spirits up. I'm sure it'll blow over, she replied, doing her best to sound confident. Plip, plip, plip. Just a few moments later, rain began to fall on the windshield. Soon, a torrential downpour engulfed the SUV, the barrage of raindrops sounding like popping popcorn. The five of us all fell completely silent as we navigated the storm, with Jay slowing down and following the red taillights of the cars in front of us through the solid curtain of water obscuring the highway. After what felt like an eternity at the mercy of the storm, the sign for our exit emerged in the distance. Jay carefully pulled off the highway and guided us towards the final leg of the journey. It was still an hour or two to the lake and our cabin, and we spent this last chunk of time hoping that the weather would clear up. The clouds were dark and gray all the way to the horizon in every direction, and none of us could bear to imagine our summer vacation getting rained out. Addison continued to do her best to keep everyone's spirits up, checking her weather app every five minutes and looking for some promise of sunshine in the near future, but 
things still weren't looking too good. There's the turn, Curtis suddenly called out. Walnut Road. Jay swerved right, sending a splash of water pooled by the side of the road spraying off into the distance, like one of those theme park rides. We found ourselves on a dirt road carved through the woods, though it was more like a mud road by the time we found it. We splashed through the soaked terrain for a few minutes until we came to the cabin. Wait, that's it? Katie blurted out as we all stared through the front windshield, our vision cut back and forth by the wipers like the shutter on a camera. It was true, the cabin wasn't quite as big as it had looked in the pictures. We watched as the sea of trees parted to reveal this slightly diminutive dwelling, which had been advertised with low, wide camera angles to appear more substantial. I especially sensed Jay's mounting disappointment. In the span of just a few hours, our sunny weekend of cutting loose on the lake had been confined to a cramped cabin. It'll clear up, Jay maintained, almost muttering to himself. It better. He pulled us into the gravel driveway and we all jumped out of the car, grabbing our bags from the trunk as quickly as possible while stomping through puddles of water. We gathered on the front porch of the cabin as Jay found the key under the mat and opened the old wooden door to let us all inside. The interior of the cabin was about as glamorous as the exterior. Again, the pictures online had been technically accurate, and yet, in the flesh, the layout felt a bit more cramped than we had hoped. We took off our soaked shoes and spread out, claiming sleeping spots and unloading our groceries and beer in the kitchen. All the appliances looked like they belonged in one of those fake homes from the atomic bomb tests. They hadn't been updated in years. Jay and Katie stood by the back door, looking out onto the lake, which was maybe 50 feet from the cabin. A small path led down to the water, where there were a few canoes and rafts on the shore. There was a small drop-off to the water, and the owner had tied a tire swing to a large tree hanging over this ledge and above the lake. One could easily swing out over the lake and jump off into the refreshing water. Addison met them by the door and pulled out her weather app once more. Okay she said. So now it's going to rain through the night, but tomorrow it is supposed to clear up. Jay turned away from the door. Sorry, guys. He sounded legitimately disappointed. It's all right, Jay. It's not your fault or anything, Katie offered. Coming here was my idea, Jay said. It's just not quite the first night I was hoping for. I guess we'll just try to have some fun inside. As if to punctuate the sentiment, a loud crack of thunder made us all jump. We finished unpacking our stuff, then started to make some dinner. That evening, we stuffed our groceries into the old fridge and decided to make some omelets. We used all the eggs we'd brought and chopped up some tomatoes, green peppers, and onions. There was a small screen porch on the side of the cabin, and we took our plates out there along with one of the cases of beer. It was dark outside by this point, and the sound of the rain on the trees echoed loudly on the old porch. I remember I was sitting in a wicker chair right next to the screen, and I could feel the warm summer rain misting through it. Small pools of water were forming on the floor as the rain sprayed inwards. One of the warm puddles reached my bare foot as we all ate together. Somewhere in here, I decided to try a beer along with all of my friends. I'd always been hesitant in the past about drinking, maybe because I hadn't felt totally safe or comfortable. But with my close acquaintances in a cabin in the middle of nowhere, where no one would be needing to drive anywhere, I decided that one couldn't hurt. Eventually, with all of us now working on a beer or two or three, Curtis decided that it would be fun to play a drinking game. The game Kings won by popular vote, but then we all realized that none of us had remembered to bring a deck of playing cards. Okay, there's got to be a deck in here somewhere, Jay insisted. Don't all old cabins have a closet somewhere full of cards and puzzles and board games and all that crap? I feel like it's a rule or something. And so he sprang up from his seat and set off, determined to find the playing cards. Jay wasn't gone for more than ten seconds. Again, the cabin wasn't very big. Before he called out from another room, Aha! I told you! 
We heard some shuffling sounds as Jay fumbled through whatever closet he was in, and then re-emerged onto the screen porch with something in his hands. They got some playing cards? Curtis asked. I couldn't find any, Jay replied. But check this out. Jay sat back down in his damp porch seat and placed a dusty, flat cardboard box on the table. The box, held together in places by scotch tape, had that old musty closet smell, like it hadn't seen the light of day in years, which was strange because the top cover of the box was so faded, it was almost illegible. There were also old brown water stains on the corners. It was like all of the elements had taken their toll on it simultaneously. I reached out and wiped a layer of dust off the top. I could just barely make out the letters on the cardboard. It spelled Ouija. Oh, no, no, no. Addison reacted immediately. Absolutely no way. She backed away. Oh, come on, Jay coaxed. It will be fun. We're stuck inside anyway. It's either this or an old puzzle with some birds on it. I myself wasn't sure what to make of the Ouija board. I had never used one before, and I certainly didn't take them too seriously. Maybe it was the beer or being stuck in the old cabin thanks to the pouring rain, but I decided to join in. Don't worry, Addison. If anything happens, we'll stop, I said. Yeah, come on, Katie joined in too. Soon all five of us had pulled up our chairs and started setting up the Ouija board. As we pulled the old board from its cardboard container, I was struck by how weathered it looked. The ones I'd seen before were more modern, a glow-in-the-dark version but this one seemed to be decades old, and looked like it could fall apart at any minute, much like the rest of the cabin. We cleared our plates from the table and placed the board flat at the center, then finding the planchette, or the piece that pointed to the letters. We found a candle in the kitchen and brought it out to the table, turning off the lamp on the porch and sitting by the glow of the flame. Darkness surrounded us. Insects chirped loudly outside, as the sound of the rain continued to echo through the porch. We all placed our hands on the planchette and sat there for a moment, listening to the storm. It was Jay who asked the first question. Spirits, he called out into the dark, adopting his best clairvoyant voice. Why does your cabin suck so much? We all laughed and Curtis threw an empty beer can across the table, hitting Jay in the face. Come on, man, Curtis cackled. If you're going to do it, do it. Take it seriously. Okay, okay, okay. Jay calmed the rest of us, and we all grew quiet once more. Jay took a deep breath. Are there any spirits here with us tonight? A low rumble of thunder in the distance. The candle flickered, probably due to the slight breeze in the air from the storm. But it was then that the planchette started to move. Come on, stop it, Jay, Curtis laughed. It's not me, Jay protested, chuckling. It's Katie. It's definitely not me, she insisted. The mood was hovering in this strange place between light and heavy. We were all a bit buzzed, having fun and feeling excited, but at least for me, it felt a bit charged. Like something creepy was happening and some part of my brain was taking it seriously. I watched as the planchette drifted towards the bottom of the board, slowly past the letters, slowly past the numbers, and landing on the words, good, bye, that were at the bottom. The planchette drifted slowly to a stop, coming to a rest at the farewell. Good, bye. Where are you going, spirit? Jay asked, confused. It's weird. I thought that's what it's supposed to say at the end, when the ghost leaves. Addison then chimed in. I noticed her voice was quivering a bit. Maybe the spirit isn't leaving. Maybe it's telling us to leave. Another roll of thunder. Addison pulled her hands from the planchette. Addie, it's okay. We're just having fun, Jay insisted. It's just a game, Katie reaffirmed too. I could tell that Addison was getting legitimately creeped out, though. Jay was getting more absorbed in the game, though, and wasn't paying too much attention to Addison. He asked another question. Spirit, what is your name? Again, we waited. 
After a moment, the planchette moved again, a little faster this time. The letter I, then the number eight, then the number seven, then back to goodbye. Addison suddenly jumped up from her seat and screamed. What? What is it? Jay shouted, and the rest of us stood up as well. Curtis reached over for the lamp and switched it back on. By the time the light came on, Addison was in the far corner of the porch. There's someone outside, she cried, her voice now trembling. Jay spun around towards the direction she was looking. What? You saw someone? Where? He asked. Addison was pointing to the other end of the screen porch. With the lamp now back on, though, it was nothing but pure darkness and the sound of the rain outside. I'm telling you, Addison cried. As we were playing, I saw the shape of someone standing outside, right up against the screen. Just the dark outline of a person. A chill ran up my spine. I looked towards the other end of the screen porch. I'm telling you, there's someone there. Curtis reached back over to the lamp and switched it off. We all focused on the darkness outside, our eyes slowly adjusting again to the lack of light, allowing us to see out into the surrounding trees, their leaves bouncing up and down as the drops of rain fell upon them. Our eyes adjusted slowly, but even after they did, there was no one there. Jay went up to the screen and looked out into the woods. He stared intently into the trees as best as he could through the darkness. I'm telling you, Addison insisted. Someone was standing right there. Okay, okay, maybe we are a bit too drunk for this. Curtis blew out the candle on the table and started to gather the Ouija board. I really thought it looked like someone, Addison maintained as she helped clean up. We all kind of tried to laugh it off, still feeling the buzz of the alcohol, but we were also a, a bit on edge. Even if I didn't necessarily believe that a ghost had been standing right next to us, the, the image still gave me the chills. We picked up our plates and packed up the Ouija board and decided to start getting ready for bed. I put my plate in the old sink and went off to my designated room, which was a little side room right next to the screen porch. There was a musty couch in it that was both too short and too narrow for me to sleep on comfortably but would have to do for the weekend. I returned the Ouija board, packed up in its box to the closet, and grabbed a few blankets and an extra pillow. I had this pipe dream that I could turn the small couch into even a vaguely comfortable sleeping spot. As I closed the closet door behind me, Katie walked by, toothbrush in hand on her way to the bathroom. Spooky stuff earlier, she chuckled. You're going to be okay sleeping slow close to the porch? I tried to laugh off the situation as well. The only thing keeping me up is going to be this awful couch. I continued on my way back to my room, but Katie started to ask me something before I could get too far. Kind of weird what the board said, right? I eight seven. I-87. That's the interstate we took to get here. Maybe the ghost was telling us to leave. Katie's voice sounded different. She wasn't joking anymore. She was creeped out too. We were just all sub subconsciously moving the planchette without realizing it. That's how I heard that game works anyway. I did my best to dispel any notion of a ghost actually communicating with us and put both of our minds at ease. Katie smiled, nodded, and continued on to the bathroom. With all the commotion of Addison's sighting, I had totally forgotten about the last message from the Ouija board. I-87, goodbye. It was pretty strange. I pondered more how Ouija boards worked while I set up the blankets on my couch. There was only one bathroom in the cabin, and Katie had just gone in to use it, so I laid down on my makeshift bed and waited for her to finish. I don't remember exactly, but I think this was around 2 a.m. I stared up at the wooden beams in the ceiling and heard a low roll of thunder off in the distance. I woke up suddenly, bolting upright on the tiny couch. I'd reach for my phone and check the time. 4.30 a.m. 
I'd been so worried about being able to fall asleep on that stupid couch that I'd fallen right asleep. I grabbed my Ziploc bag of toiletries and headed over to the bathroom. The cabin was quiet. It seemed like everyone had fallen asleep, too. I walked past the door to the screen porch, tossing a glance out at the scene of our seance, but it was too dark to see much of anything. I continued on to the bathroom. Inside, the bathroom was surprisingly large. The toilet, the sink, the tiles, everything still felt old, but there was more room than I was expecting based on the rest of the cabin's layout. On the far side of the bathroom was a big shower, a large tub with a semi-opaque shower curtain around it, hanging off a rusted metal bar. I flipped on the light, but the fixture on the ceiling didn't seem to be working. I saw there was a small seashell nightlight plugged in next to the bathroom mirror, and I flipped it on, barely illuminating the bathroom with a pink glow. I washed my face and was maybe a few seconds into brushing my teeth when I thought I heard something. A small, slight tinkling metal sound. It seemed to come from the direction of the shower. I turned and stared at the curtain, still wrapped completely around the tub. My eyes were drawn to the little metal hooks that attached the grommets of the curtain to the rusted bar. Had it been the sound of one of them moving? I stood still for a moment and listened for the sound again. Nothing. And yet, as I stood there, my attention stayed locked on the shower. It's a hard feeling to describe, but the hair on the back of my neck did stand up, and I just felt wrong. For some reason, instinct or whatever else you want to call it, it felt like someone was behind the shower curtain. I stared at it as I finished brushing my teeth, packing up my Ziploc bag and heading back out into the hallway. I turned off the seashell nightlight and instinctively glanced back at the curtain. In the darkness of the bathroom, I could barely make out. Someone was behind the curtain. It looked like a dark shape, a feathered outline of a silhouette, head and shoulders on the other side of the plastic. Was one of my friends actually standing there? My hand slapped around the wall next to the mirror, searching for the seashell nightlight. I flipped it back on, but the figure was gone. It had been right there. I had seen the shape in the dark. My hand trembled as I walked over to the shower and reached out to the curtain and pulled it back in one swift motion. The shower was empty. I backed out of the bathroom quickly, switching the light off one last time and fleeing back to my couch. Had I just been seeing things? Addison's sighting earlier had probably just planted the seed of fear in my mind. I had to try to fall back asleep. It had been so easy earlier. In reality, I didn't sleep much for the rest of the night. I tossed and turned, thinking about the figure that now two of us had seen. No, 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 I thought. Addison got spooked and spooked me in return. That was all there was to it. The rest of the weekend was much better. The sun did come out the next day, and we got our money's worth enjoying the lake, the canoes, the swing, all of it. We grilled hot dogs, drank some more beer, and finally enjoyed being outside. I didn't tell anyone about my creepy encounter in the bathroom, and we all had a great time. The story doesn't quite end there, though. That Monday, as we drove back to the city, we hit a terrible patch of traffic about halfway through our journey. For what felt like hours, we crawled along the interstate, wondering what could be the cause of the jam. I sat in the back seat, listening to music and watching the other weekend vacationers stuck in their cars. Oh no, Katie suddenly called out from the front seat. Look up ahead. It was an accident. I could see the sirens in the distance flashing red and white against the blue sky. As we drove past the scene, I did my best rubbernecking out the window and gawked at the destruction. Multiple cars were involved. Pieces of metal and glass were scattered across the road. One of the cars was especially devastated, crumpled like a piece of paper into a ball. Almost unrecognizable as a vehicle apart from the steering wheel I could see poking out of one side. It all happened quickly, but 
I could swear I saw blood on the interior. Gross, gross, don't look, Katie cried as we passed the wreck. The accident faded out of view as the cars picked up speed and the traffic cleared. In that moment, something hit me. I thought about that night around the Ouija board, the strange message pointed out by the planchette. I-87, goodbye. That night we had wondered if the ghost was trying to tell us to leave. Maybe instead, it was trying to warn us about something terrible happening on Interstate 87. I guess I'll never know for sure. Ooh, another twisted tale of terror. They were so worried that being stuck in that cabin would be dull, but well, with a ghost around, one will never be too Ouija bored. <laughs> yes, I think that's all for now, fellow ghouls. I should go do the rounds around my manor and keep an eye out for that mysterious intruder, the one who cut my phone line. Yes, I have to figure out what to do about this no phone situation. I can't call the repairman to come fix it. Maybe there's another phone on the grounds that I can use. Do you remember one? Hmm. Anyway, I'll keep brainstorming, I guess. Do come back and see me again sometime soon, and I'll have another true scary story waiting for you. Good night. <laughs>